Every once in a while, you have the opportunity in your life to think something through carefully, to plan it out, and then to try to execute it and find out you missed the practice. In some way, shape, or form, you made a mistake. And so as the slides were going across today, kind of saying thank you to those people, I was actually giving you a monologue at the same time, kind of explaining the jobs that they did and how valuable it was. Uh, I'm sorry you missed that. Um, turns out uh, the microphone wasn't connected there at the right time. Uh, but the host team, you know, shaping and forming us in how we're worshiping, the scripture readers and the great diversity of voices that we had there, particularly having our children as part of that being very special. And the music team, the worship music team, having families there, which we don't normally get to see, but due to the pandemic and the way things are, we got to do families leading us in worship and how special that has been. And then of course our producers, those who are the host on Zoom and making sure that our tech, technology stuff all works just right. So thank you so much to all those people, really appreciate it. How familiar are you with pottery and creating pottery on a spinning wheel? So the wheel spins around really fast. You put a clump of clay in the middle, you get some water and add it to the clay so it becomes a little slippery. And then you start to shape that clay. You push on it hard to kind of get it centered. And then you dig your fingers into the top and pull out to shape it and pull it out. And then to pull it up, you kind of jam one finger underneath from the outside and one finger just above from the inside and you push together forming and guiding the clay as you pull it up pull up the walls of the clay into a cylinder you're forming and shaping the clay and we can picture that we can see that when we hear isaiah talk about who are we but clay in the hands of the potter and at first glance that sounds kind of Offensive. Half a second here as I turn something down. Just that one. And at first glance, it seems kind of offensive. The modern human being is not supposed to be somebody who is formed and shaped by the things around them. The modern human, we think of human flourishing, is the one who is self-determining. It would almost be worse if we got called sheep, though, wouldn't it? Who likes to be called a sheep compared to a very not so intelligent creature, the way it seems that they act? And yet in scripture, of course, we are compared to sheep regularly. As we enter into this second part of our large series on 1 Peter, we're gonna be paying attention to the capacities that the church has. And the first one that we're gonna pay attention to is how do we form and shape Christians? How do we form and shape each other? Now, the four foundations that we went over in the last four Sundays, uh, this time I'm going to have my microphone on while I do this. You'll, you'll watch. It'll work a lot better. Uh, so the four foundations that we went through, the first one it was chosen and exiled, identifying that in the reality of Christ risen and ascended, we are chosen and loved by God, but we live in a world that is not the kingdom of our Lord, not fully, not yet. It is, but it isn't. And we live in this tension. And that's part of what it means to be Christian in this end of the age time that we find ourselves. And the second foundational identity that Peter shows us in his letter is that we are born into a living hope. And this hope is based upon the resurrection of Jesus and our resurrection to come, and that God is making all things new bending them toward his will. This hope drives us and gives us strength and gives us the life of God in us even now. And then third, we talked about what it means to be holy, how Jesus crosses the boundaries of clean and unclean, and how we as Christians are called to live into his promise that we shall be holy as he is holy. His holiness infuses us and helps us to become like he is, holy. And we follow him when our holiness is willing to cross boundaries and to go into places of hardship and even suffering in order that we might fulfill and participate in the life of God here on earth. To be holy might lead very much so towards suffering. And the suffering is the fourth item that we found in 1 Peter as foundational to the identity of a Christian. Suffering as part of our identity. 
because of being chosen and exiled, because of being living with a living hope so that when we're holy, we're able to cross over those boundaries. And that doing so will cause threats to people, ourselves and others, because of sin in our lives. And so suffering becomes part of the identity of the Christian in this day and age. As we move now to look at the four capacities, we want to ask, how, do, how does the Christian church fulfill and shape these four foundations? How do we pass on the faith from generation to generation? The author Gordon Smith, in his book, Wisdom from Babylon, he identifies these four, and I want to pull them out and, I, and work them through over these next four Sundays. And the first one is that we need to be a liturgical community. We need, need to be a community that has developed the capacity of liturgy. And that's what we'll explore today, and I'll explain why that is so very important. The second capacity is our capacity to be theologically integral to who we are. We need to have good theology as a church and as individuals in order to be Christians in this age. It is a capacity that is necessary for what it means to be Christian now. And we need to, ooh, well, we need to write the right words there. That should say hope against a backdrop of lament. Hope against a backdrop of lament. That's our third capacity. And it's the capacity of the church to share and to live and to preach hope even in the midst of a time of suffering in our world. How important in this season of the pandemic is it for the church to be a people of hope while admitting and recognizing the reality of suffering around us? And then fourth and most important, the capacity that we need to develop as a church that we need to live into is the capacity to mediate, to feel, to know the presence of the encounter of the real time risen Jesus Christ. All these things, everything that we do as a church, whether it's service for others, whether it's creating a really cool, exciting, engaging worship service, whatever it is that the church does, it is nothing but fluff if it does not have a real encounter with the risen Lord. And so that'll be the fourth capacity that we explore together as we look at these four capacities of the church. The first capacity that I want to pay attention to is liturgy. Let me pray and we'll look into and then we'll look into what I mean by that. Father God Almighty, we ask that you would by your word this morning and by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would illumine our minds, rekindle our hearts, and strengthen our wills. In your name we pray. Amen. First Peter has a spectacular verse that Dave read for us today. This verse about our calling to be a holy priesthood. This is so foundational to the identity of the Christian church today. And it's something that we need to come back to again and again. How are we doing? Let's understand that. Let's take a look at it. And let's take a look at what it means to be the holy priesthood. And so that's what we're doing in these four capacities. How is the church a holy priesthood in 2021. What does it mean to be a priesthood? And so these four capacities, I believe, are the capacities, the skills, the, the, they're what the priesthood does. And the first one we're going to look at is liturgy. And this one is so important because liturgy is what forms us. Liturgy is something that forms and shapes us. And I want to first ask, how are we formed outside of church? And I'm going to be relying upon a book called You Are What You Love for a lot of the thought behind this and some of the examples. A few years ago, there was a very popular TV show called Friends. Perhaps you've heard of it. If you've watched the show Friends for any amount of time, more than likely, the way that people talk to each other in that show has started to impact you and shape the way that you talk. And I've seen this particularly in people who are younger, but even older people. If they are watching a significant amount of the show Friends, they start to have a jabbing sort of conversation with each other. In the TV show Friends and other TV shows of our day and age, it's become quite popular. You have the characters kind of shoot barbs at each other, really harsh 
just really degrade somebody for laughs. It's quite funny to say that Ross, you know, he's the nerd, or to say that the other character is just so brainless that he can't even function as a human being. And you just pass it off for laughs and move on. And that comes into our regular daily language. You start to see kids in particular take this on and try it out. It's funny on TV, maybe it's funny in life. So that's a very small way. It's impactful, but it's minor for where we're going with this in how something that we watch and participate in can form and shape us. Well, people around the world have been able to figure out that you can shape people unconsciously and it's quite powerful. Perhaps you've noticed if you've ever been in a men's public washroom that the floor around the urinal is not particularly clean. Well, they figured out that if men have something to aim at, they're much, like, much more likely to hit the target and there's a lot less splatter. So what they did is they painted on the urinals a little fly or perhaps it's some other object in different places or different manufacturers of urinals. But if there's a target that the man might be interested in shooting, there's way less pee on the floor. Incredible. So, uh, so advanced our civilization is, is it not? You can have small things that shape the way humans behave, but you can have larger ways of shaping people. And the ways of shaping people is not necessarily neutral and good. You can shape people towards ends that are not necessarily neutral or good. Now I'm gonna go through four examples of this. And I'm not saying that these are necessarily evil things. As I list off these four, there are many more and it's worthwhile to think of in your own life what is shaping and forming you. But as I go through these four, I am not declaring them evil, that we should never participate them in them as Christians. What I am saying is that we need to be aware at how these are shaping us, how they are forming us. Jamie K.A. Smith identifies a couple of these, and he talks about them in his book, You Are What You Love, and in his three-part series, and he identifies how these have very specific liturgies that form us and shape us. The first one is the mall. Now, there's not a large mall here in Courtney Comox, but perhaps you used to live in Vancouver, or even you've been to Nanaimo and seen the larger mall there. As you enter into a mall, you come into that space, and there's a openness, an entrance that kind of begins to transition you from outside to inside the building. There will be objects that can give you information or perhaps a greeter. If you are new to the place, perhaps you're just a seeker on the way, you will move through that space and there's things that can help you figure out how to move in the space. If you pay attention, you'll see the people who come here often, they don't need the information, they can bypass it directly because they know how to operate in this space. Often the spaces in malls are open up above. There's a large vertical openness, kind of signaling transcendence and power. And there's a feeling of sanctuary and retreat in a mall. It's closed off from the busyness of the rest of the world. Here we are about something sweet and pleasant and soft. It's meant to feel comfortable. It's meant to make you feel like you can get what you want here and enjoy yourself. And if you pass through these halls, you'll see along the sides of them, along the way as you go, you'll see, what are they standing in the windows? Are they not the icons of the age? Are they not the iconogra iconography? The pictures of the saints are posted on the walls of the shops, aren't they? And you can see these icons, and in a sense, we are worshiping them, wishing that we were like them. Oh, I, I wonder what I would look like if I behaved and acted in the way that these pictures do. The similarities to a cathedral with its saints posted on the walls around it is remarkable. The images that are there in the mall present to us a standard of judgment. And we ask ourselves, where do I stack up? Where do I compare myself to? Perhaps we visit the mall with friends. Maybe it's a communal experience but all along the way we are checking each other out. There's the quick glance. Have you been or seen a group of teenagers that just come together? One of the first things they're gonna do is they're gonna look head to toe at each other. 
What are you wearing? How are you wearing it? It's all part of the same religion, if you will. Shop, therefore you are, identifies Jamie Smith. Worship and desire to be the best possible you with the best possible accessories. The second example of a liturgy that shapes and forms us happens in the stadium. And these are powerful rituals. You go and you visit the stadium to cheer on your team. There's an enemy team, if you will, and we're going to go through some practices and rituals. And if you're unfamiliar with them, there might be a guy standing. I actually have a friend who does this. He goes to the Whitecaps games in Vancouver and he leads some of the chants and the cheers. And I don't know the singing yet. I'm kind of fumbling my way through, but he's there helping me understand when to stand up, when to sit down and how to cheer. He's helping me to make sense of and participate in the ritual, in the worship. The beginning of the game at the stadium also has significantly powerful rituals that we participate in. You stand for the anthem, that's become very key, has it not? And there's often a flag present. Even if both teams are from the same country, perhaps we still sing the anthem. And I have to wonder, what are we rehearsing for if we're practicing for something at the stadium? The third example I wanna draw your attention to is something that happens more one-off in your life, perhaps. Maybe you visited something or somewhere like a all-inclusive resort or a cruise or a theme park or something in that manner, something that you visit more irregularly. They're more rare. They impact our life because we are waiting for them. And after having been to them, we talk about them for a while. I had the opportunity to go to an all-inclusive resort a few years ago and when I gather together with the people who were there with me, we reminisce about, remember that time, and wasn't that special? And if there's others who have been to the holy pilgrimage to the great Mecca of all-inclusive, they similarly can also, ah yes, isn't that wonderful when it's just like that? Our visit to the holy place, the holy land, in a sense we visited the promised land, where all of our desires are met, Whatever we need is taken care of. I didn't have the opportunity to do this, but if you puke in your room, someone will come and clean it up for you. You don't even have to clean it up yourself. I don't even have to really adult there. There's not the responsibilities I have back at home. And there's so many restaurants that I can choose whichever one I want to, and I just go any time of the day, it's ready for me. This is the holy place. It's the good place. I get to have a pilgrimage to it sometimes. And the rituals while we are there reinforce my pleasure and my comfort. Fourth, I want to identify something that I am finding it's quite powerful right now, and I'm not quite sure how in ways that it's forming us, where it's positive and where it's negative, but I'm beginning to pay attention to it, of course, as we all are. And this is the rituals around our phones, our devices, our online social media, places like Instagram. What's happening here? What are the rituals of formation that are happening particularly in our unconscious? Quickly select the next thing. Just skim over this one and I'll go on to the next one. If I like it, I will let the person know, I will let the algorithm know. I want it to show me the things that I like. I want to keep being entertained. I want it to keep me in the zone. I actually lose track of time here. How long have I been here? What did I even watch? I don't even remember. I've got a few minutes here while I wait for my ride to come. Quick, I'll pull out my phone. I can visit this place. I'll watch TikTok. I'll swing to the next one. Show me the next one. That's funny. Ha ha. And I'll share that with my friend. I'll just send it off because I thought it was funny. I hope they do too. What are we worshiping as we practice these rituals? What are we worshiping in that space online, particularly with my head craning down and my neck stretched? And what's the similarities with online church? Have we had any sense of that here in this pandemic? What does it mean for us to have shifted our church to online? And how is the liturgy being changed? 
What rituals do your Sunday mornings have? How have they changed? And how are they forming you? What do these things form us into? If we look at the mall, most certainly it is trying to form you into a shopper, into a consumer. It's trying to convince you that you need to upgrade as required and that you will do so when you are programmed to do so. It's forming you and shaping you to participate in that. Now the malls perhaps are sliding away. Maybe the Instagram is the mall extended into the realm of content and online. Here we are shopping, but in a different way. Here we are upgrading as required, but perhaps in a different way. And the overlap between the Instagram and Twitter phenomenon and religion is so strong and powerful right now. You will have confession in Instagram and Twitter. And even if the influencer that you hear and listen to and you kind of support them and you write back your confession that seems to echo theirs, they may not respond to you, but you still feel heard because they touch something that you believe also values and matters in your life. And you made the same confession about how hard you're having things right now. And it went out into the ether and it feels like you were heard. In the stadium, what are we rehearsing for? I think someone figured out fairly early on that in the stadium there is a powerful nationalistic opportunity. And that you can imagine that the one cheering for the blue team and the one cheering for the red team, when war comes to our country, won't it be so special when red and blue cheer together? They might not be the ones on the front line of the war, but they will be the ones here in the country who are cheering and supporting their team. I think the stadium might be very much so, the rehearsal for war shaping and forming us to support and to participate as called upon. The all-inclusive, the one-off, what is this forming and shaping us into except to shape us and form us into people who, are pri who will prioritize our own comfort? What do these all have in common? They have in common the formation and shaping of us primarily unconsciously, towards ends that can be turned towards a profit. They aim to create in us predictable behavioral patterns so that we will behave as expected, so that we will be shaped to love and to desire what these things want us to. They are forming us below the conscious, not just in what we think, they're forming us in what we feel. Identified in you are what you love, these are ordering and shaping our affections. They are shaping our desire. They are shaping what we love. Jamie K. A. Smith is working off of the, the work of Charles Taylor, a philosopher, who uses the phrase social imaginary. That these liturgies that we participate in form and shape our imagination of what life should be like so that our desires then, in keeping with that, will shape and form our behaviors. These are powerful liturgies. Can we participate in them with our eyes open and not be as affected? For sure. And as we identify in our own lives small and big liturgies that form us and shape us, we have the opportunity to choose to continue to participate in them, and maybe we won't be as affected, or maybe there are some that are so powerful that we need to step out of them. What Jamie K.A. Smith identifies is that you are what you love. So much more than you are what you think, you are what you love. Our vision and our orientation is determined by the liturgies that we pay our attention to, that we participate in. I love the verse that Jocelyn just shared. If you have a chance, check that out in the chat from Romans. In the letter of John, 1 John, he writes at the very end. He ends abruptly and he says, beware of idols. And so much so, these liturgies draw us and form us towards an idol. So then we turn, of course, to the Christian formation. If we are to be called a holy priesthood, 
how do we form and shape ourselves? How are we formed and shaped by each other through the Christian liturgy? Worship is the imagination station. And the word liturgy kind of feels a little unsettling to many Protestants because liturgy sounds like dead church to us. But every single church has a liturgy. Liturgy is simply meaning, meaning what do you do as the practices that you regularly participate in on a Sunday morning? That's all we're trying to say by the word liturgy. How are you forming and shaping your hearts through your Sunday morning worship? And if you go into any church, you can try to read it. Does this church shape you more towards a consumeristic kind of Christianity? Does this church form and shape you towards a, a heart of service? Does this church, does its liturgy form and shape you towards what? Can you identify it and read it? In my life, I've had the opportunity, and I still am, quite enamored with coffee. And as I was getting into learning about coffee and learning more about how to make coffee, I got into espresso and espresso machines and trying to learn them. And I would often buy a cheap one and tear it apart and rebuild it and have a great time with it. What I found out was that the most important thing was calibration. You need to calibrate the machine. And the most important tuning and calibration that you can do is actually of yourself. You need to find out and taste what good coffee tastes like, so that when you go and try to make coffee, you have a target to shoot for. You need to calibrate the actual desires of your heart as a barista in order to do the work of making coffee well. So Sarah and I, of course, we went down to Seattle and we tried to visit as many different places as we could. And we spent a couple of days there just drinking coffee all day long. <laughs> And we did a bunch of other things as well, but it was a calibration of the machine, if you will. Desire is caught more than taught. And so we have to calibrate the machine of the Christian faith. And liturgy is the ways and means in which we shape and form our hearts so that we will live out the four foundations of the identity that First Peter calls us to. Jesus confronts Peter on the beach and he says to him, do you love me more than these? And Peter's like, yeah, of course I do, my Lord, you know I do. What we're doing on Sunday mornings and in other gatherings that we get together for, what we're doing throughout the year as we pay attention to the rhythms of the year through Advent and Lent in particular, but other Christian holidays and celebrations, we're trying to form and shape our desires so that our desires are for the good life as God defines it, not as we define it. Desire is caught more than it is taught. And of course, that should make us immediately pay attention to how do we teach our children? How do we teach our children so that they would grow up in the faith? Do they need more facts about Christianity? Or they, do they need some desire formation? Peter identifies that we are the holy priesthood together, that there isn't a select few that are pulled out from the church to be priests and the rest of them are the receivers of the priest work, that we are all called to be a holy priesthood. This is a work of the people. The word liturgy means the work of the people. We have the calling to be priests to one another. That's why our liturgy on Sunday morning should be multi-person involved as much as possible bringing each other into the presence of God, helping each other to mediate the presence of God to other people so that we can invite our neighbors in, so that we can care for one another because we are priests to one another. Liturgy sustains the Christian identity. I think that's why this pandemic season feels so hard for us right low down in our stomach because we're missing out on the formational liturgy that is so important to us. As Augustine says, worship, liturgy, is the gymnasium for our heart and soul. That's why it's so important that we do our liturgy well. We don't make it a performance, but we certainly want to do our best. We want to offer up to God and to each other 
excellence so that we know that everybody is welcome here at the same time as we do things well and excellently. Finding ways and means that all people, as Peter calls us to share our gifts with one another, that all Christians are able to share in the gifts that they have been given so that the gifts can be given to the whole church through them. The liturgy restories us. We're not just forming a Christian club, but forming Christian desire, forming Christian desires that are congruent with the crucified Messiah. And we are being equipped to love what God loves and to love how he loves so that we would follow him all the days of our life. And the last thing I want to draw our attention to about liturgy is that it's not merely the steps that we do in that space, but it's also how we order and shape that space. As a church, Living Hope, we don't have a building. So wherever we worship, we need to pay attention to the space that we are in, to use art and to use ways of shaping the movement of people through that space and paying attention to how it is forming and shaping us. The buildings that we worship in will form and shape what we love. The art, the decoration, will form and shape what we love. We are embodied souls. And as we worship God in heart, in mind, and in spirit, we do so in such a way that we are formed and shaped into his image. The liturgy is incredibly powerful, and it is most powerful at the unconscious level. So let us as a church pay attention to our liturgy as we move into the next chapter of our life as a church. Pay attention to how we worship and how we worship with our children in particular. How do we pass on the faith so that the desire to have the life as God would love us to have it is caught by their hearts? And let us build one another up in the faith, using our gifts to serve each other in the liturgy and in life together, so that we forever would live out these four foundations, chosen and exiled, holy, in the living hope, and suffering with that hope, so that we would bring Christ everywhere we are. Thanks be to God.